I will say so. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ann Vernon Gray, and I'm the Senior Associate Director for Undergraduate Research at um, the Center for Undergraduate Research and Fellowships, otherwise known as CURF. Um, and we are um, really excited to be doing this series for the second year now in collaboration with MindCore. And if Heather or Michelle wants to introduce MindCore. Um, MindCore is uh, a center housed within the School of Arts and Sciences that's trying to bring together um, scientists and students working across mind and brain at Penn. Yes. And so the Behind the CV series is really a, a information series, a conversational series, really, I would say, than an informational series designed to help um, people, whether you're an undergraduate, a graduate student, staff member, whoever you are, um, to uh, take a little bit of a peek behind the veil and see um, how people got from maybe, um, you know, everywhere from, you know, first grade, fifth grade science projects or whatever it is uh, up through undergraduate career and to where they are now. And I think it's been really um, helpful for those of us who are attending to see that it's not always, in fact, very rarely a linear path. And so today we have speaking with us, Dr. Desmond Oaths, and um, I will say professionally uh, an introduction um, is that he is an assistant professor in, <clears throat> excuse me, a um, couple of different departments that happens at Penn where you have uh, joint appointments, so psychiatry um, and neuroscience, uh, also affiliated with um, a couple of different centers. Um, Institute for Translational Medicine and the Center for Neuromodulation and Depression. And, and again, in his laboratory is using um, novel neuroimaging methods um, to understand um, how the brain and its networks uh, contribute or are affected in uh, affective uh, illnesses and, and disorders. Um, and, you know, by all means, we will welcome him to speak um, about that a little bit. But but what we are um, inviting him to speak without, about today is not going to be listed on a CV. It's, it's, that's the whole point of the, of the talk. Is so we're going to get to see behind it and um, how he ended up in his, in his current role um, and the, the, the turns and, and trials that it took to get there. So without further ado, I'm going to let Desmond introduce himself however he chooses and, um, and start telling us his story. Thank you. I'm uh, happy to be here. Thank you for those who nominated me to come. Um, so um, yeah, I took, I took a few notes here that I'm going to look over while I'm talking uh, because uh, it's kind of challenging to characterize sort of uh, growth and development and decisions along the way and what influenced me, but uh, I uh, a nice chat with my grad student and getting some other feedback from people in my lab about things that I've spoken to them about that they thought might be worthwhile to share with all of you guys. But uh, hopefully there's not too much fluff in there that's, that's not very interesting. Uh, so I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area around San Jose. Uh, I moved around a fair amount. Uh, especially when my mom's hospital bills were too high and we had to find cheaper places to live. Uh, my parents did not graduate college. Um, my natural father died when I was two, uh, and that was probably good because uh, he was a violent, scary guy. Um, my mom died when I was 19, my brother eight years ago. Uh, my stepdad is still alive. He's in his 80s. Uh, early 80s, 82. Um, there's a bunch of mental illness and substance abuse in my family, as I'm sure many of you uh, have in yours. Um, I would say that my childhood was uh, still pretty good. I grew up in a safe neighborhood, um, but there were also some uh, like not great things happening at home. There were some pretty scary situations occasionally uh, I was in significant danger, um, but you know those things kind of happen intermittently. And the other times, I felt like pretty good, especially when I was smaller. My mom was very loving. My family was 
like uh, I had a lot of fun with my stepdad, um, watching movies and video games and going on hikes and little camping trips. So most, most of what it looked like from the outside was pretty good. Uh, we just sometimes have these uh, very scary situations happen with um, like people that my mom would bring home and would be suddenly living with us and were really scary, scary people. So uh, yeah, so um, I was a pretty shy and inhibited kid. Um, I usually had a, a couple of buddies that I'd hang out with. Um, when I got to high school, uh, I, I got to be a little bit more of a jock. Um, I uh, was co-captain of the football team and captain of the wrestling team. I was on the homecoming court, which is still kind of surprising to me because I was still kind of socially anxious. Um, I partied a lot in high school um, with my older brother up in San Francisco or nearby uh, where I lived with my high school buddies. I did not take high school seriously. Uh, I considered playing football to go to college, but I couldn't get enough of a good ride to go to a really good school. And so I decided not to play any sports in college. I uh, went to a community college, which I think is a great way for a young person uh, paying their own way to cheaply get core classes out of the way. Uh, I would, like paying my own way, maybe uh, I didn't explain that. So when my mom died when I was 19, I was in my first uh, year of college and uh, my stepdad asked me to move out. Uh, so I moved out with uh, uh, my ex-girlfriend at the time uh, and, and so was going to school and uh, working. Um, so community college was definitely a big help to get through those, those classes. Uh, then I transferred for, uh, after the, the two years of community college, I transferred to Cal State. Uh, I volunteered in a cognitive neuroscience lab at Stanford. Um, I also had a bunch of other jobs at the same time. So I was uh, like a busboy doing catering jobs. I had this crappy office job. Uh, when I was in college, I took that more seriously because I was thinking, wow, it's a pretty crappy life of what you could do without an education. And I think I want to be a psychologist and that means grad school. And I, I had thought of being a psychologist, like even through high school, because I thought, oh, what could be more interesting than studying people and their minds and how they work? I thought that would be the, the like, most ideal thing to study. Um, I found it pretty easy to get A's in college, um, um, but I'd kind of um, slack off a bunch and I'd be, I was working a lot, so uh, I'd kind of read the textbooks, chapters, most of it the night before the exam and cram for it and then uh, do really well in the exam. Uh, so uh, there was one class, uh, a psychology, experimental psycho psychology class, experimental methods, where the first exam I didn't do very well and I was so irritated. I was like, oh, the college is easy. Why would I do so badly on this exam? That's so irritated. And I went to talk to the professor and try to argue all the questions and say, what is this? And he explained to me that I was, I was totally wrong. And <laughs> it's like, okay, well, uh, I'm gonna really focus on this and ended up feeling that I really liked the experimental methods and the kind of logic behind them. And so that made me think that, okay, well, if I go to grad school for psychology, get a PhD, maybe I'll even end up being a scientist. What I think I wanna do is be a therapist, but maybe I could do some of both and maybe that would be the ideal uh, situation for me. So that's what I was thinking about um, prepping for uh, potentially going to grad school. Uh, let's see, I've always had math anxiety and that persists to this day. Uh, I avoided taking math classes in my senior year of high school, for example. I dropped out of math and took a weightlifting class instead. <laughs> so uh, that probably doesn't sound like a typical uh, Ivy League professor, <laughs> but that was me in high school. Uh, it took me a long time to graduate college because I was working so much. I was trying to save up some money for uh, the grad school applications and then moving and being able to have like uh, uh, first and last month's rent for an apartment. So I was preparing that. 
Uh, things were easier uh, for saving wise once I was, I lived with my ex-girlfriend's parents for a while and then I lived in my stepdad's garage uh, for the end before I went to uh, grad school. Uh, so I studied my butt off for the GREs. I'd have a couple classes per week um, from college. I'd have a job, I'd come home, I'd change clothes for the next job, I'd come home, I'd study for the GREs, I'd go to sleep, I'd wake up and do it all over again. Um, so I was very diligent uh, then. Uh, I'd, I'd gotten most of the like hardcore partying stuff out of my system by college. So I was very kind of focused by the time I got to college. I uh, got into grad school at uh, only one place and uh, during the interview, I sort of changed my mind even about what I wanted to study uh, compared to what I uh, put on my application. There was a lab doing like physiological measurements of um, anxiety before and after psychotherapy. So I was like, oh, that, that's so awesome. You could quantify something that's so complex, like how somebody's doing emotionally and track it with therapy to prove that there's something that changed and it actually worked. I thought, oh, wow, that's so cool. I really want to do that. Um, but another thing, I, I had a lot of freedom in um, grad school. My advisor was very kind of hands off. And so I, I ended up finding this brain uh, it's kind of motor physiology lab that had a brain stimulator that they were starting to pursue a little bit in, in depression. Uh, there were a few studies out there and I said, oh, I totally wanna use that. And I approached him and asked him if, if I could and he uh, helped me get it set up. And uh, we did a couple of studies on undergrads. So that then that has paid off for me because that decision uh, kind of paved the way for things that I'm doing today with brain stimulation. Uh, so after I graduated uh, with my PhD in clinical psych, I kind of felt like um, I was on I was on internship. That's the last thing you do to get that degree, a, a year long full time clinical internship, which sucked. It's like all day long seeing patients and doing paperwork for patients, and it was so draining. I didn't get to do hardly any science. I had this tiny rotation uh, in in the second half of the year, uh, doing a little bit of. EEG stuff, but mostly it was all patients, patients, patients. And I was like, I like seeing patients, but this is just draining. I can't take it. Uh, whereas when I do science and I spend like uh, long, long days doing science, I am energized. I'm excited to do it. And so that's another kind of clue to me. Like, hey, this is, <laughs> if you do clinical work, only do it uh, like part time again and uh, do as much science as possible. Uh, so that's what I was thinking when I got my uh, first postdoc, which is at University of Wisconsin. I really wanted to do functional MRIs, which uh, they didn't have available at Penn State when I was there. Uh, so I got to learn that in Wisconsin. Um, we were a couple of years in and I got a training grant, uh, my first grant. And uh, it took me a, a couple of tries to get that. I was excited. I was like, all right, now I'm set. Uh, my wife uh, started uh, law school in Wisconsin, and she was actually, right when I got my grant, she was admitted as a transfer student to Berkeley. And the economy was doing pretty bad at the time, and we thought as a couple, like, I'm never going to be a money <laughs> earner. We need to put more into her career. So she moved to Wisconsin for me. It's totally like a better decision for us to pick up and go to California. Uh, back to California for me. So we did that. She transferred to uh, Berkeley and um, moved out there and uh, had no job, uh, which was tough. We didn't have much money. She's in school. And uh, the PI at Wisconsin said that he could continue uh, funding me for a little while. So I thought, okay, I'll be all right uh, once I go to California. But he said, oh, sorry, I, I uh, I, I actually don't have any money for you at all. <laughs> I can't pay you anything. So uh, I scrambled around, tried to reach out to um, people that I'd met at conferences who were in California, uh, other postdocs, uh, PIs that I'd met, uh, scheduled meetings with them to say, hey, do you know of anybody looking for somebody with these skills? I'm ready right now. <laughs> I'll do assessments. I'll do whatever you want. Just uh, give me a paycheck. 
Uh, and I ended up finding a, a psychiatry resident at Stanford who I'd met before. And I said, and I gave him that story and he said, oh, actually I just got this big grant from NIH. I'm gonna start my own lab here. And it combines that brain stimulation that you've done before and he'd never done before with imaging. And he said, so you would be the ideal person to come help me start this new project. I said, yes, right now, can you start paying me right now? He said, well, no, the grant's gonna take a couple of months. He said, oh my God, I don't know how I'm gonna get through even the next couple of months with no pay. But he, he found a way to put me on this other, uh, somebody else's grant temporarily for a month or two to get it started until his funding came through. I'm so grateful for that because it was really tough uh, when we landed there. Um, so Stanford was, was a good place. Um, I got to work with a lot of awesome people. I was there for a long time. I applied for uh, so many grants, so many, so many training grants at the VA because we had a VA affiliation through Stanford and NIH and I didn't get any of them. I applied for so many, so many, so many things. And finally, um, the last year that I was there, I had this small grant funded in RO3 from NIH, um, very small. Um, but uh, let's see, so uh, at a conference actually, I was showing uh, my work and somebody told me that there's a new center starting at Penn and the lady starting that was looking for new postdocs or potentially junior faculty and that I should talk with her. And so I talked with her. She said, oh, you have to come be a postdoc at Penn. I said, uh, no, I'm not gonna come <laughs> leave. My wife has a good job in San Francisco. We just bought a house. We have a little baby. We're not gonna <laughs> pick up and move, uh, especially just for a lateral transfer of being a postdoc. And she said, okay, well, all right. Uh, well, what would it take for you to come? I said, okay, well, I'm gonna be happy staying where I am. So you're gonna really have to give me something I can't turn down, which is buy me a whole bunch of equipment, bring my favorite coordinator from Stanford and pay for his way, give me guaranteed funding, uh, give me a tenure track assistant professor job and uh, make it all happen. And uh, she made it happen. So <laughs> I said, okay, uh, I guess we're moving to Pennsylvania. And my wife was like, okay, well, I guess uh, we, could, we could do that since this uh, kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity. And uh, she has family, she's from Pennsylvania. We met at Penn State. Uh, so she's like, okay, and I have some family out here too. So we're like, okay, uh, we, we have some people that uh, we could be close to family and we could go back to Pennsylvania. Uh, and so we decided to move. Uh, also, I got lucky again that when I started applying for grants, there was this new uh, brain initiative at NIH, which was a really good fit for the kind of work that I do. Uh, so actually, my even though I applied for so many training grants at Stanford and didn't, didn't get them funded, the very first R01, I applied for it and I got it funded on the first try. That never happens. <laughs> so I was really, really excited and I applied for a bunch of other grants. Actually, the next R01 I applied for got it on the first try. Another similar big grant from NIH called an RF1 got that on the first try. And it's just everything's taken off and everything's really, really good. Uh, so my wife didn't have a job when she moved to Pennsylvania, but also through networking, uh, she was able to get a, a, a good job. We were living in a very small row house, um, one bathroom upstairs. It's basically one and a half bedrooms. Uh, and so we had our little guy in there. And when we had another baby in the row house, we had to squeeze her in the little corner of our tiny bedroom. <laughs> we were very packed, like very, very packed. Uh, but we stayed there for a while, we saved up our money, uh, we bought a house, so now we live out on the main line and a nice house in the great school district, everything is great, life is good. Um, with our two, two little ones are now three and five. Uh, I should also mention that um, the clinical training that I did, I went all the way with it, so I also got my postdoc hours, I took the exams to get licensed, uh, but I haven't seen clients in 10 years. Um, and I still feel like having that in my pocket in case there's not enough grant funding to 100% fund me is worth having. Um, but I hope that I never have to do full-time clinical work, but I still 
would like to have a little bit of it going on, I, I do feel like that's a little bit of a safety net. Um, what else? So in terms of uh, what I attribute my successes to, I think it's mostly luck. I think there's also a lot to say about networking. Uh, so just like meeting people, talking to them, going back and bothering them and like being upfront with what you're looking for and just being friendly with people. I think um, being a friendly, agreeable person to work with uh, gets people to want to collaborate with you and to remember you um, and trying to like fulfill your promises to people and um, be a good mentor and collaborator. Those things are really important. Also not being too flexible. So when it comes to somebody uh, kind of taking advantage of you to recognize when that's happening and to kind of dig in your heels and say, nope, nope, that's not going to be the way it is. Uh, we're not going to do it that way. I'll just stay where I am. I'll do something my way. I, I don't need uh, what you're offering that badly that you can really walk all over me. So that's definitely come up for me when I tend to just kind of be an agreeable person and, and uh, help people out when they ask for things. Um, also, yeah, this imposter syndrome, that's absolutely the case. Do I deserve to run a lab at Penn? I don't think so. There are a lot of deserving people out there, super smart, work really hard, and have been doing that all their lives. I think, uh, like I said, a bunch of lucky factors kind of came into me, but I also wasn't too kind of dumb not to recognize something good when it came up and to go for it and to really try for it. Uh, so that's, that's been really important for me. Uh, I'll say being a scientist includes enormous mountains of rejections all the time, applying for grants, for jobs, trying to publish your work. You have so many like tedious things that you have to do, useless paperwork and human subjects training and writing IRB proposals and writing grants over and over and over and over and over and over again. There's bureaucracy. It's hard to figure out how to get promoted. Um, you have anxiety about your funding, not only for yourself, but for the people in your lab. You don't get paid very well. Um, there's a lot of competitive jerks with big egos that'll like stomp on you and treat you badly. Um, but uh, there, but um, you know, it's, it's the best job I've ever had. I've had a lot of crappy jobs. This is not a crappy job. I really, really love it. So the process of discovering something new scientifically is really thrilling. Uh, I get to work with brilliant, passionate people. They inspire me. Um, it's, it's just the best. Um, so I, I'm still anxious about whether it's going to last. And I don't know whether it is. But for right now, it's really, really fun. Uh, I tell my kids about that, uh, how much fun that dad has at work. And I think they, they can see it. Like, um, I think my wife took a different route. She's like steady and stable. That's, that's what more of her uh, kind of bent with uh, deciding on a career. And for me, I've, I've gotten lucky enough that I get to do things that uh, are really, really fun. Uh, every day I actually have fun <laughs> at work. <laughs> so uh, it, it's pretty great. I will, I will say that there are significant barriers uh, for somebody with my background. Um, I am white. I did grow up in a like uh, not crime ridden suburban area. So those things help me. Uh, but I was not headed in a good direction, I think. Uh, so yeah, my brother didn't make it. Uh, like there's there's a lot of people in my family who are like didn't do so well um but i've gotten really lucky and i think i've made a few good decisions along the way uh that, that have really helped um, get me where i am i also say that um one of the um one of the things that i've talked to a, a lot with my mentees are is uh telling them that just because you're smart enough to get a PhD doesn't mean you should, right? There's, there's a significant cost to that. You should have your eyes open. You know, you're going to have friends that uh, get real jobs right out of college. They're going to put down roots, have families, save for retirement, go on trips around the world, and you'll have nothing. You'll be struggling, working day and night. Uh, 
like not having any money for a very, very long time. So learn to be frugal basically forever if you want to be an academic. Uh, but, but I'm talking to people who are like me, uh, less so to the people who have affluent, educated parents who are helping them out a lot and uh, will pay for the down payment on their house, will take care of their kids, like will totally take care of them and they have nothing to worry about. Like I, I have a different um, perspective, I guess, than, than the average kind of person who is like me in, in my kind of job. Uh, so most professors fit the stereotype, right? They come from educated, uh, wealthy backgrounds, and it's just a given that they're going to be successful at something. And I've uh, been surprised at each step that I have been successful because I, I didn't set my sights very high uh, growing up. And so it's, it feels great, uh, but it also feels weird and like it's not real. Um, so also one of the benefits of being an academic is they have flexibility. So if uh, somebody needs to take the kids to the doctor, I can take the kids to the doctor. If the kids are sick, I can stay home. Uh, I, I have a lot of flexibility. Nobody's waiting to see what time I come in and what time I leave. And that feels really good. That feels like you have some control of your life, which is great. Um, yeah, so um, I will also say about having kids, having kids is the best thing ever. It's really hard finding childcare is something they don't tell you about. It's so, so hard. Like finding somebody decent, affordable, willing to work long hours, but stay patient with your little ones. Like, wow, that's a big, tall order. Childcare facilities are so expensive. They're booked years in advance. It's, that's been a real challenge uh, since uh, moving to Pennsylvania, which is the first time when we, we started looking for childcare. Uh, also say my role as a dad, like um, that's my, the best thing in my life. It's the most treasured thing ever. And um, it, uh, like taking responsibility uh, for your kids is something that I think is a given. Uh, still, no matter what I do, uh, how hard I work to take care of them and, and uh, do a good job as a dad, I'm, I'm totally like a drop in the bucket compared to my wife. So she's just awesome. And I'm, I'm really lucky. And I'm lucky with my kids too. And I tell them that all the time. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that's basically what, I, what wisdom I have to impart. Um, based on where I've been. I'm glad to take any questions if there are any. Well, I just really appreciate your um, sharing that as uh, like not a typical um, conversation and um, your willingness to be so honest is, is uh, refreshing. So um, while people sort of get their thoughts together about what they might want to ask, you kept talking about luck, which, you know, I, I have a frequent saying that I use, which is I'd rather be lucky than smart any day. And, and that just happens because um, mostly I use that as a crutch because I don't think I'm very smart, but um, I, I, I do believe um, you're underplaying it a little bit. And one of the things that we've heard over and over again in these, in these conversations is, um, you know, something you alluded to about not being so dumb as to recognize a good opportunity and some of that has come at least from other people that we've spoken to in this series about, you know, is having mentorship, um, people that you trust who you can sort of bounce things off of, um, who help point in the right direction. Yeah. And so I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about whether mentors played a role in your decision-making processes, whether you felt like you needed to be I mean, you're always your own advocate, and that came across very clearly. Um, maybe not by choice, but um, but just how you know maybe what role other people made in your decision making processes, and and whether you what advice you have for people who are seeking out who don't have sort of natural mentors and and in the seeking those out because I think you that networking piece if you could just maybe flesh that out a little bit that would be helpful. Okay, sure. Uh, I think. For me personally, um, my um, like colleagues in similar positions have been uh, 
bigger help to me than mentors who really like took me under their wing and tried to help elevate me to the next career stage level. Like the, there have absolutely been mentors who have made significant contributions and said, hey, we wanna keep uh, Desmond in our center. We need to muster the department resources to hold on to him. Uh, things like that that have been really helpful or reading a grant and giving me feedback and saying what they like, what they don't. Very, very useful, very really clearly um, uh, necessary to to learn the skills and to move on. But I, but I feel like um, emotionally and uh, the, the uh, friends, uh, like having other postdocs or grad students to talk things over with was even more helpful to say, uh, you know, stick it out. I applied for this grant this many times and I finally got it. Or, uh, you know, giving advice to each other and commiserating when we are all struggling. I mean, uh, almost no postdocs get uh, to run their own labs, uh, but we're all trying for it, right? So all of us are hanging out saying, oh man, I didn't get the grant. Oh man, you know, to um, commiserate with each other. That was that was a, a real benefit to me. And in grad school, we had similar things where you're just like, oh, this is a killer. It's taken me so long. Can't get it done. Uh, yeah, my friends are supporting me. But but networking, I think, is uh, can't be under stressed. <laughs> like really, getting your name out there and doing it yourself. Don't expect that your mentor is going to. Uh, introduce you at a conference and blah, blah, blah. You have to like, you have to do that stuff. You have to go meet those people, even if it's scary, like me being socially anxious, going to a conference, I'm like <laughs> make myself go up there and do it. You just keep doing those same things, like presenting your poster in a t at a conference, doing a talk, approaching some famous person that you want to talk to. Uh, you just keep doing it. You make yourself do it and you get better at it. Thanks. So yeah, Heather put in the chat, feel free to post something or just unmute yourself and shout out. Well, I can ask, oops, sorry, <laughs> Michelle and I are both trying to fill it at the same time. Um, I'll go first and then I'll, and then I'll hand it over to Michelle. Um, well, first I should apologize because I, when we opened here, and you were asking for who, where your name came from. And I said, it wasn't for me. And because I said, you know, I was just like, oh, he's a white professor at Penn. Like I, I assumed that there was a story and your story was quite different. And so um, I should apologize because I totally made an assumption about you that, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't fair and wasn't true. You know, your, your story has a, has a lot of trauma in it. And I appreciate that you, sh you know, that you shared it. Um, one of the things that was this weird theme that came through last year um, was that we had some faculty who actually had done sports in high school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, I, th I found it kind of interesting because in some ways, um, in, the other, in the case of the other two, they were also both first gen and it felt like actually sports might've been this thing that they were first kind of recognized for. And it was so odd because, you know, being at a place like Penn, I just thought, oh, you know, sports, whatever. Yeah. I just kind of discounted it, but it feels like it's more than just the sports. It's sort of the confidence. And I wonder if you felt like, you know, wrestling and football, if any of that sort of played into um, some of your kind of perseverance and, um, and ambition. I think that's probably true. I think um, there is some degree of perseverance that um, that you get uh, from sports and, and also some like uh, camaraderie with the people that you play sports with. I mean, you feel very close to them. Uh, I did uh, with some of my buddies who played like multiple sports with me. We we're really close buddies. Like we're, we like threw each other around and ran into each other and like shared in triumphs of each other when when things went well or or didn't uh yeah so i th i think there's a lot of kind of character building that that uh, sports uh, uh 
helps with. And, and I definitely appreciate that. I, I wasn't sorry not to play sports in college though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, okay, I did that thing. Uh, I, I don't like somebody yelling at me and blowing whistles at me and stuff. <laughs> but I like exercise, but I don't want somebody screaming at me. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting because one of the things that came through before was that there's like there are schedules that you have to be at practice and you have to maintain your schedule and those are some other things that sort of set you up for success. It was interesting to me because I have never when we think about sort of the STEM pipeline and and bringing students to Penn like we I've kind of discounted sports as a as a way that I that has been a real way that a lot of people who wouldn't have traditionally gone to college do get to, do get to college or um, so. It makes me think about sort of when we think about issues of inequity, like in um, in Philadelphia public schools, like there's, you know, there are whole schools that don't have, like, I don't think there's a gymnastics team in all of Philadelphia and only a handful of schools have, you know, other, like wrestling. I, I don't, I can't think of one school that has wrestling. I'm sure there are some of the biggest high schools that do, but like my, my kid's school doesn't have wrestling. <laughs> um, sorry, I, let me hand this over to Michelle then. Thanks, Heather. Um, yeah, I really appreciate your story. And I was struck in particular by what you said about um, just because you're smart enough to get a PhD doesn't mean you always should. And I, I think kind of that decision point for a lot of people is tough because it's hard to envision what a, it, it's not just a job, right? It's like a life, it's a full lifestyle. And I was wondering how you figured out that that was a life that you wanted or how maybe other students at that decision transition point might kind of figure out, reach out, like where to, where to figure out if that's the life they want. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. For, for me, I feel like I have a decent sense uh, of the students that I mentor or that uh, work in my lab. Uh, I feel like there, there are some people where I'm very sure that they're really going to love the life and they should go for it and it's usually something like they're so curious they can't help but continue to ask questions over and over and over and go try to look them up and summarize some papers on their own and they're just fascinated by everything that they can learn and they're so curious about well how can we figure this out how can we figure that out and they're just so motivated that you can tell that when they're off with their friends or walking to the train, they're thinking about research. And if you're already doing that at that level, you, you should, <laughs> you're gonna be happiest as a scientist, even despite the cost <laughs> of like having very little money, having to move a bunch of times and make new friends, uh, like all those things that go along with the cost of doing it. Uh, but most people are sort of in the middle where I say like, uh, for those people, they should really carefully think about what are they giving up and what will life be like and how long might it take before they could run their own lab and what are the steps along the way and are they going to be happy doing those things because, you know, if you really feel like you can't be happy until you run your own lab and do your own studies, then that's going to be a miserable, very long time for you. If you can think of yourself along the way and say, in grad school, I think that's just going to be great. It's going to be fun. I get to take classes. I get to do some science. And being in grad school, I'm just going to be happy there. If you can, if you can kind of uh, agree to that scenario and you're like, I don't need to get a job right away. I don't need to settle down and have roots in a place. And it'll be fine with me. I feel flexible enough that I could do it. I think uh, that's a decision point where you're like, okay, do I see myself there or do I not? Do I not? And with these achievement-oriented kids that I get to work with and mentor, it's often about, well, what's the next thing I can achieve? What's the next benchmark? What's the next milestone? And I, I could get a PhD. They're like, wait a second, wait a second. Are you really going to be happier uh, if you're working towards that PhD or should you do something else? Like you could achieve something without getting another degree even uh, that might feel rewarding. Thank you. That's funny. Um, for me, it's, if I could have been a perpetual postdoc, right? Where I just, I'm at this sort of peak of my skill, technical skills, but I'm not responsible for anybody else's like livelihood, that would have been excellent. Um, 
Uh, does anybody else have a question? I don't want to suck all the air out of the room. So maybe from a, a pragmatic perspective, you you mentioned you said one of the things that stuck out in my head was you know it's hard to know how to figure out how to get a promotion. Like how does that work, right? And at least in the fields I'm familiar with, they've made great strides in trying to be much more transparent and clear about like you must have X numbers of publications or have this much grant money or have um, you know um, published this book or or whatever it is. Is that is that not been your experience? Is that still shifting landscape? And what what recommendations do you have for um, negotiating that in the same way that you did? When you came to Penn and saying, "Look, here's here are my here are my hard stops." Yeah, the, so I I would say that there are clear uh, categories of things uh, that are put out there that uh, will uh, help you to get promoted, um, but there aren't any fixed numbers for any of them. So they say, "Okay, you need an international reputation. You need grant money. You need publications. Like you you have the list of things that you need." Uh, to get, but you're like, well, how many publications and how good should the journals be and how big should the grant money be and should it be a fresh grant or should, is, does it count if I'm at the end of my grant and I haven't gotten a new one? There are all these scenarios where it's not clear that you get this number, this number, this number, therefore promotion. So they just take your dossier, they sit in a room, like uh, they look it over and <laughs> they make a decision and uh, it's just people looking over your credentials and your achievements and making a decision whether they think you should be promoted or you shouldn't and so it's kind of scary but it's not seniority it's not like doing a good job it's <laughs> like some combination of these factors and you're just not sure how many in each little bin you need in order to get promoted so um, Heather has asked, uh, there's this question in the chat for you. Um, uh, first, thanks so much for sharing. Uh, I also avoided math classes in school and feel kind of behind other than neuroscience because I don't have a biological or statistical background. Do you have advice for people in this situation who still want to be scientists? Sure. Um, I think you should try to make up for as much as you can. Uh, even though it's hard to go back and try to learn things, um, but try to maybe focus it on a goal of something you want to understand better. So if you have some numbers in front of you and there are different ways to kind of manipulate them and learn a new statistical package or go through some lessons on how to run an, an analysis or um, quantify something, uh, for me, but to have a specific goal in mind helps me pick up new school new, new skills that are uh, mathematical and make me scared um, but I also for me I separate statistics a little bit from uh, math so there's a certain amount of math you need for statistics but you can get insight in statistics in, in ways that for me are very challenging in math because I have a problem that I'm focused on and I want to know is group X bigger than group Y and so with statistics I can get some insight and understand it better whereas math it's just like a little more challenging for me to connect with it. Uh, so uh, another thing that you can do is if you are very skilled in other areas and so you have a chance as a scientist collaborating with people that are a lot more quantitative is definitely a possibility. So people don't know how to do the brain imaging, don't know how to interact with the patients, don't know how to do a bunch of things that I know how to do. And I match up with somebody who's just pure quantitative, just like crunches numbers all day long. And I help them crunch the right numbers and we come up with answers together. And so there, there are people like that, absolutely. Uh, in at Penn that I work with that are very, very highly skilled at quantitative things that I, I'll never catch up with, with them. Uh, but uh, I try to learn enough that we can make reasonable questions together and answer them together. And sometimes it's a struggle because I don't speak enough of their language and uh, but but it also happens the other way where I'm so entrenched in psychopathology that they're like, what are you talking about? It, the scale says anxiety and it doesn't measure anxiety. I'm like, yeah, let me explain that. And we we work on problems together and 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 that's definitely something that you could do.
Thanks for that question and answer. So maybe one other question I have is, uh, since, we're, but since we're talking about all sort of things, neuroscience and, and psychopathologies and things, um, compartmentalization comes to mind. And I think another, in addition to sports and mentorships, these themes sort of come out. And one of them has just been how the influence of early childhood, you know, you, you sort of swear, like, I'm never going to do this or whatever, my parents or any of my parents, this sort of thing. And yet there seems to be this thread from childhood, right, that, that in retrospect, um, looking, looking backwards, the, the pieces are all there and sort of breadcrumbs. So can you, do you, can you talk about given the history of your of your family that you that you shared so freely with us and 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 with your brother and 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 um, this feeling of making it out, how that's influenced your decision to do what you do and how do you separate your sort of personal from your professional or or do you do you think that makes you a better scientist? What advice do you have for? I mean, because I think we all have these personal passions that sort of drive us, um, but it needs to be somewhat different than that because it needs to be sort of academic and intellectualized yeah 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 i, th I think um i think it helps me uh to be uh, a better mentor and to be a, a better scientist to to feel like um i know what emotional pain is like and uh i i am trained in helping people get through it and I've also had my own experiences to draw on. So I, I think I use it um, where, it's, where it's useful and I can kind of push it off uh, and put it out of my mind when it's not useful. So there are like things I don't wanna think about. Um, and, uh, but you know, not, not that I'm really avoiding them, but just that I feel they're not very useful to me. And so if somebody talks to me about something that, and they say, hey, what happened? Can you tell me about that? I'll talk. I'll, I'll talk about things that, that have happened, but I don't uh, kind of dwell on things that are not very useful to me. So um, things that are hurtful or painful, like they come out occasionally, but like you said, like putting them in, in their own kind of box and uh, looking at them from a different angle and saying, okay, well, you know, that's not going to be me. You know, I'm not going to be like that. And there are, there are things that uh, I really love about my upbringing and my childhood that were really great. And I want to, I want to keep those going with my kids. And then the things that uh, were scary, I'm like I would never in a million years consider any of these scary things. I'm never, ever going to do them. Uh, but I'll keep an eye out for scary people or scary things because I've seen it up close. And uh, I, uh, I'm going to do a good job of protecting people I care about. Uh, so I think it, it informs uh, my, my ability to, I think, maturely handle things that come up at work that are stressful, you know, things in life that happen. Uh, there's some resilience built in, some like insight you get from experiencing some challenging things and thinking about them later. And it's also sad when I see that people like my brother or other people that have gone through uh, similar things through childhood that uh, they haven't been able to overcome those things. And like, I can't even always help the people. I, could, I couldn't help my brother overcome uh, his uh, history and what, what he was dealing with, but maybe I can help somebody else, you know, in my life or in my professional world. Uh, so I'm, I'm motivated by that. And have you ever thought about doing something else? Well, if you weren't you, what, what else would you be? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I thought I might uh, learn to be a winemaker if I didn't get into grad school for psychology, <laughs> even though I don't really like chemistry. <laughs> like, it just seems like a cool life to live up and work at a winery. <laughs> so that was one of my backup plans. And then I thought maybe I'd go into business, but I, I worked in an office for a while and it was awful <laughs> for me. Like, <laughs> so. Yeah. One of the things I really appreciated about um, what you said too was how that you, um, you you try to be friendly and agreeable and you know so that people want to work with you. It feels sometimes like there are kind of there are two two models. you know there are the people who are just reliable and they're good and they say yes and they want to help and they want to support. Yeah. And there's like sort of the the crap, you know 
right. <laughs> just, you know, I am me and get away. Yeah, and right. it's, um, I, I guess I don't really have a question really. I just wanted to say that I appreciate that. I mean, it's certainly, it's, um, a, there are some really notable people who are in your camp and it makes it yeah. a lot more pleasant. Like that's oh, yeah. what we're always trying to do is to bring people together, but I don't want to bring people together with jerks. No, <laughs> I was told by a senior mentor not long ago, uh, she said, you're too nice. That's your problem. You're too nice. <laughs> and it's like, you, you may be right, but you haven't seen me when I'm digging my heels in because we haven't had that kind of conflict like this mentor and I hadn't had that where there was a resource, there was a problem where I disagreed and we had to push back against each other because I, I feel that I am pretty firm uh, mm -hmm. when I'm like, that is not right. This is what I want <laughs> and I dig in. Uh, but all the rest of the times uh, you can be so friendly and agreeable until you need not to be. And I yeah. think that's a good a good line to kind of figure out. And if you if you make a mistake, you will make mistakes. You'll be agreeable, and people will still trample on you. And then you try to recover. And there'll be times where you stand too firm, and then you realize you didn't need to be, and you need to be able to apologize to repair the relationship and say, "Sorry, I was just getting a little like testy because I had this old mentor who stomped on me in this thing, and and I realize you weren't. I'm really sorry." I'm going to do better next time. So you just, you, you try mm -hmm. <laughs> to be flexible, to be agreeable, to make your stand when you need to, because you will need to, like mm -hmm. that will come up. And uh, it, like nobody can get away with not uh, like digging in and like fighting for something that, that, that they know is right. If you want to be like successful and do well. Conscious of the time, um, I don't know if anybody wants to get a last minute comment in, but if not, going once, going twice. Um, I hope you'll uh, join me in thanking Dr. Oz. This has been just an absolute uh, pleasure to spend this time with you. I uh, really appreciate your, your, your wisdom and your uh, insight and your willingness to share it. Um, and we hope we will see everybody next month. All right. A lot of fun. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for the folks who've come. Take Thank care. you so much.